Hmm. It's got to be around here somewhere. I told a friend I was feeling stuck on this paper I'm writing because I can't tell whether to use a direct quote or to paraphrase. And she told me she knew a guy, whatever that means. She wrote down the address and I've been walking all around the city looking for it. Ah, here it is. But which door should I choose? Direct quote or paraphrase? Well, how am I supposed to know? Hmm. We've arrived at Lesson 3, Unit 4 of High School Writing, wherein we'll learn when and how to use a direct quote, when and how to use a paraphrase, and how to make those decisions depending on what your purposes are for writing. We'll also talk about how to work with direct quotes to best put them to use in your writing. Have your PDF ready for note-taking because we're opening this red door! Before we get started, I know that you may already know a little bit about this topic, especially if you've been following along with the other lessons in this unit and course. So let's first record what you already know about this topic on your PDF. Pause this video and answer the question you see there. What did you write? You may or may not know at this point that the main reason to choose a direct quote instead of a paraphrase as evidence in your writing is if you're planning to explain and analyze the language in the quote, the imagery, diction, syntax, etc. If you were with us for some of our previous units and lessons, you may already know about this, but I think it's worth it to note again. You'll want to use a quote to point your reader to a word or phrase you are going to analyze thoroughly. And you'll also make sure that your choice to thoroughly analyze this word or phrase supports your purpose for writing as well as your claim. Recently, I wrote a paper about the use of motif in Toni Morrison's novel Beloved which tells a story about formerly enslaved people who are grappling with their painful pasts as they try to make lives for themselves after emancipation. The thesis of my paper was, the motif of the tobacco tin in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, reveals the way in which unprocessed or unresolved memory can destroy people's abilities to fully connect to others in the present. I drew from scenes throughout the book to help me make this claim, but one passage in particular was really powerful in its telling of how one character, Paul D., is haunted by places, people, and experiences from his past. This passage reads, It was a long time before he could put Alfred, Georgia, Sixo, school teacher, Hallie, his brothers, Setha, Mr., the taste of iron, the sight of butter, the smell of hickory, notebook paper, one by one into the tobacco tin lodged in his chest. Now, let's say I wanted to analyze the author's use of imagery and sensory details to support my claim. I could either use a full direct quote, using the whole sentence as my evidence, or a partial quote, a selection of just the words and phrases I am going to focus on. Let's compare what using the full quote looks like versus using the partial quote. If you want to spend time thoroughly unpacking a sentence or two to describe how the words, images, phrases, diction, rhythm, structure, or style contribute to your interpretation of the text, you'll use a full direct quote. For example, in this passage, I was struck by the author's use of a long list of people and events, separated only by commas, and the way those words create kind of a breathless rhythm that evokes how flooded Paul D. is by his unending memories. For this reason, I'm going to want to use the full quote to really illustrate that to my reader. 
I wrote, after he shares his harrowing story of his time on the chain gang, Paul D. recalled that it was a long time before he could put Alfred, Georgia, Sixo, school teacher, Hallie, his brothers, Setha, Mr., the taste of iron, the sight of butter, the smell of hickory, notebook paper, one by one, into the tobacco tin in his chest. Notice how in this example, I am integrating the quote with my own introduction to it, so my reader knows what I am talking about before I dive in. Next, I'll add a sentence of explanation to put this quote in my own words, and a sentence of analysis to show my reader how I'm interpreting this quote to help me support my claim. For more on writing explanation and analysis sentences, see Unit 2, Lesson 3, and Unit 3, Lesson 5 of this course. First, as my explanation, I'll write, Here, Paul D. is overwhelmed by his many painful memories of places, people, and events that have caused him harm. Then, for my analysis, I'll add, the long list of words, separated only by commas and spanning over several lines of text, speaks to the overwhelming flood of memories that prevent Paul D. from moving forward from his past and fully embracing his present and future. For this analysis, it makes sense to use the whole quote, because that's the best way for my readers to follow my argument and really see what I'm talking about. But what if I want to use the quote differently? What if instead of closely analyzing the whole passage, I want to just pick out one or two words that really pack a punch? In that case, I choose to use just a little bit of the quote, like this. Let's say I just wanted to look closely at the image or motif of the tobacco tin mentioned in the passage. In that case, no need to quote the whole passage. I'd just write something like this. Paul D. shoves his memories into a tobacco tin lodged in his chest, where they lay forgotten about for years. Then I'd explain the evidence to give my reader a little more context by adding an explanation sentence like this. A tobacco tin is an object used to store a substance commonly known to be dangerous to humans. And here we see it lodged or completely stuck in Paul D's body. Next, my analysis sentence explains to my reader how I am making meaning of this segment of the quote I chose. This image points to the dangerous and harmful nature of Paul's memories and suggests that they are so deeply a part of him that they have become part of his body and being. See how I've used my evidence differently to achieve slightly different conclusions? Oh. Oh. Finally, we'll talk about when I might want to use a paraphrase as my evidence, instead of a quote or a piece of a quote. You'll want to use a paraphrase to briefly note something that happens over time, like an image that occurs throughout a novel, or when you want to provide evidence of an overall plot point, series of events, or a synopsis. In short, you'll use a paraphrase when you aren't looking closely at the language of a text. If this is what I wanted to do, I'd write something like, the tobacco tin is mentioned for the second time at the end of the chapter that describes Paul D's horrific time on the chain gang, but we see it in other moments as well. While this isn't a direct quote, it's still evidence because it's a statement of fact about what happened in the novel. No one could argue with this summary. It's, what's the word? Wow! Irrefutable. Your decision about whether to use a full quote, a partial quote, or a paraphrase will depend on what you want to do with your evidence, how you are going to put that evidence to work in your explanation and analysis. In the next two days of this lesson, you'll practice making decisions about quotes and paraphrases. Then you'll use what you've learned to do some of your own writing with evidence. What could be better than that? 
Remember, as you get more comfortable making decisions on your high school writing journey, we are right here with you. Right on. Hey, hey.